Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about the German G43 slash K43 rifle. We're going to talk a little bit about the development and the evolution of the G43 um, from the Walther G41 here and going to kind of get into some of the differences between a late war K43 versus an early G43. I'm just going to say off the bat, this video is not going to be an all-encompassing video. I'm going to give a lot of information that's not out there on YouTube. Um, but if you want to know more about the G43 or K43 or G41, uh, this is the book that you have to have. It's a two volume set. I mean, real thick books by uh, Darren Weaver, you know, Rough Forged. Um, these are sort of the book that's replacing his earlier uh, Hitler's Garand book. That book is out of print. It's, it's really you know, old information, way overpriced. Um, these books are, have so much more information. I mean, these are real heavy books. Um, so much more information. I highly recommend getting these, and they're a lot cheaper. It's like less than half the price of the old, you know, Hitler's Garen book. So if you're interested in learning more or supporting authors like this, which we really do need to support people like Darren. Um, I actually met him once. He's a, he's a real cool guy. Um, I highly recommend supporting an author. Check out the book, you know, maybe buy it. Um, I don't know what the price of this book will be, you know, when you're watching this video. So I'll just put a link in the description uh, to this book on Amazon. And um, it's, it's, it's a real good book. I actually do really highly recommend this. By autumn of 1942, Walther is already adding uh, gas bleeding systems um, to the G41. Um, it's pretty much straight up just taking G41s, um, omitting this whole, you know, bang gas trap system off of the rifle, and then kind of adding what, you, what you'd expect here. You're adding the SVT uh, gas system. The SVT is right here. Adding the gas system to the 41. They did a lot of other, you know, experiments as well with different kind of gas systems. Um, at the same time, they were also looking at replacing this fixed magazine. I mean, it was pretty much everybody knew that a fixed, you know, magazine like this is for the birds. Um, so, you know, Walther's experimenting with adding different box magazines to the gun. I think one of the first box magazines that they actually were attaching to their, uh, to their rifle was the MG13 magazine, which is a long 25 round mag. Um, but for obvious reasons, they couldn't use this, you know, long magazine. So they developed what became, you know, just the standard, you know, 10 round detachable G43 magazine. Now the turnaround on this was pretty fast. By November of 1942, um, Walther announces, you know, this new G43 rifle. Um, in the announcement, they, they note the new um, lighter weight of the new G43 and the better handling of the G43, which is, which is really, it's really important to note. I mean, this, the 41 is a lot heavier and most of that weight because of all this steel components out front, it's a very awkward front heavy feeling rifle. Um, so that's one of the things that they felt was important enough to, to sort of announce in their announcement. In January of 1943, Walther submitted uh, two semi-prototype G43s to the Wehrmacht uh, for testing and trials. Now, because of the war, they couldn't really have a thorough trial. Um, they pretty much kind of did a, a rush sort of trial, and um, pretty much everybody was happy with this new G43. They could see that it was a definite improvement to the gun. And uh, OKH went ahead and uh, thumbs up the new design, and they ordered the switchover of assembly lines from the G41 to the new G43. Now, a lot of people kind of incorrectly assume that the G43 is just pretty much a straight up G41 with an SVT gas system on it. And that's not entirely true. Um, Walther did make quite a bit of changes to the system. Um, a lot of these were for performance, and a lot of them were simplifications to speed up uh, manufacturing. Um, I have some notes here. I'm gonna just read off some of the improvements, some of the differences from the G41 to the G43. Um, the first thing was they eliminated the cosmetic machining operations, which saved two to three hours per receiver. I mean, think about how many thousands of receivers that are being made. Just that in itself is a really huge improvement. Um, that's kind of the first thing a lot of people notice whenever they look at like a G43 versus G41. Um, it's just a, it's a very rough, you know, rough forged um, looking receivers instead of this nice um, slick G41. It's also something you run into a lot on sporterized um, G43s. Um, people tended to polish these up, you know, after the war just to make it look better because um, the rough forging does, doesn't look maybe the best. Um, but they, they decided to just eliminate that. And there's actually two pretty interesting uh, pros of having this rough finish. 
Uh, the first is that this rough finish actually helps to retain oil better, which is pretty interesting. It doesn't just you know, slide off. There's more surface area to retain you know, the, the oil for the gun to keep it from rusting. The secondly, maybe a little dubious, but they also claim that it helps um, tone down glare and reflection. So I don't, I don't know, maybe if you know, the sun was real bright and the receiver was, you know, the, the bluing was rubbed off or something. Yeah. Anywho, they thought the rough forged was the matte look on the new G43 would cut down on the glare and reflection, which would give away German soldiers in the field. Another change they did, and you can't see it from the outside, but with the G41s, G41 uh, barrel and receivers were threaded, just like on like K98Ks. Um, they each were threaded, and then the barrels were screwed into the receivers. Um, now that whole threading operation and everything, it takes, a, takes quite a bit of time. So on the G43, they uh, omitted the threads, and this barrel is now pressed and pinned into the gun. So it's a much faster and more simple method. I mean, really, you know, with the service life of the rifle, there's no need for any kind of quick barrel changing. Um, so that was, a, that was a pretty big plus, in my opinion, as far as manufacturing goes. They also brought in a company called uh, Mertzwerk out of Frankfurt. Um, Mertz was a pioneer in metal stampings. You know, in, in the early 1940s, you know, stamping technology is still pretty much in its infancy. Um, but the Mertz was, you know, pretty well known for being able to design complex, you know, stamped components for firearms. Uh, they stepped in and they were able to basically transfer this action cover on the G41 that was a solid milled component, you know, took a lot of time and everything into this uh, now stamped uh, steel or stamped, you know, sheet steel action cover on the G43. Um, that's another really big savings overall on the manufacturing of the gun. In addition to the stamped action cover, the 43 also was further simplified. Um, instead of the, uh, the sort of two bands, um, that was just sort of converted to this one front band. Um, it cuts down on the amount of band springs that you need as well. You only need the one. Um, obviously, by this point in warfare, bayonet fighting is really not a thing. And the Germans understood that even, you know, as early as 1942-43. Yeah, bayonets are nice, but they're not super needed. It's pretty niche what you need a bayonet for. So they just went ahead and omitted bayonets on the 43, which was able to was able to shorten the wood, which again, you know, lightens the design. Um, so just one band now instead of two, one band spring, shorter wood. Um, and that overall really does help, you know, the, the overall weight and handling of the gun. Another big change from the 41 is the scope mounting system. So on the 41, um, if you wanted to mount a scope, it was up here with the, uh, the rear sight. I mean, it's pretty far forward. You have to have a, a long eye relief scope and it also limits your field of view and the magnification with a scope all the way up here. Um, so they switched to this new universal scope mounting system, um, which is much longer. It's, it's much better. It's back closer to the shooter's eye. Uh, they moved it to the right side here. And, and now it's something that um, Darren Weaver actually says, and I, and I agree, is that um, this was moved to the right side specifically so that the bolt handle can be moved from the right side of the 41 to the left side of the 43. Um, it's something that would make sense to, to modern shooters, um, but whenever you're handling a, um, a G41 and you, you, know, you have to you know, rack the bolt with your right hand, this is pretty straightforward, you know, especially coming from the a K98K. Soldiers are used to having to you know, use it with their, with their right hand. But now with the G43 and the removable magazine, um, soldiers were going to be holding the rifle with their right hand, removing the magazines, inserting the magazines with their left hand, and then they could just bring their, their left hand up and uh, rack the weapon now. So um, the bolt handle being moved to the left side was a major improvement in just overall ergonomics and handling and speed of reloading of the rifle. Um, so that, that's a really good choice on their part. And now because you don't have the gas trap system, you have a bare muzzle that can be threaded for accessories. The three big accessories that they wanted was a blank firing adapter for training. They actually wanted a silencer, you know, a suppressor to go on these. Uh, and then also grenade launching attachments that you could put on the G43 to, you know, launch grenades. Now, even though they're in the midst of a war, um, the G43 production is, is really imperative to switch over from the 41. 41 contracts still were completed, especially like with, with BLM. Um, they didn't switch over to start making 43s until they finished out their contract and made all the 41s and got paid for all the 41s that they were contracted to make. 
Um, so it's kind of one of those interesting things. You know, you see a lot of uh, G41s, um, just like this one here, being made up through uh, 1943. And so it's, it's one of those things where you would think G41, most of them were made in 41. But in fact, most G41s were made in 1943, and most G43s were made in 1944, because that's just kind of how long it took them to, to switch everything over. So it's just kind of a weird thing. So don't just think because of the you know, nomenclature that that's the exact years that you'll find. Um, really, everything was lagging behind for them. So now there's only two makers of the G41, or, or at least Walther's G41. Uh, of course, Mauser had their own G41 contract that was going on at this whole time. So that's a different design. Hopefully, I can make that video for you guys one day. Um, but Walther's G41, there's only two makers of it. Walther itself. Uh, and then BLM, which is uh, Berlin Lubecker machine and whatever. So the Germans desperately wanted to up the production, up the production numbers of G43s. Um, they wanted to speed up. And um, so there's a, an expansion in the, the manufacturing of G43s over G41s. Um, they added another manufacturer to, you know, to the two from the G41s. Um, they added uh, Gusoff work, which used to be Simpson before the war. Um, so they brought on this third main contributor of it. And of course, there were tons of other various little companies that made parts for, for G43s. I mean, all the way from you have um, Sun and Tian and France making receivers, um, pretty nicely finished receivers um, for G43s. You have some, you know, some concentration camp slave labor type, you know, G43 stuff being made. So um, there's a wide variety of components and everything being made and put into this effort. Um, they were just really desperate to, to make as much stuff as they could. Now, full-scale production of G43s really didn't get started until kind of late 1943, early 44. Um, Walther was making like a few thousand by the end of uh, 43, but a lot of those weren't really finished until 44. So a lot of the 43 marked Walther guns, which are scarce, were actually finished uh, early 44, so you can't take that receiver date for 100%. Um, BLM, they kind of were just an early 1944 thing. It took them a little bit longer to get the machines and everything set up. Now, kind of just like with a G41, in early 44, the Germans are already looking at ways of simplifying, you know, the, the new simplified rifle. They're, they're looking at ways of simplifying and speeding up production of the G43. Um, we're going to get into some of those specific differences a little bit later on in some close-ups. Um, but it's just one of those things, even though they already sped up a gun and simplified it, they wanted to do more. They just they were just constantly trying to up the production numbers. Now, in April of 1944, that's when the name change happened. So Hitler ordered um, changing the name from you know G Gewehr 43 to K or Carabiner 43. Um, no actual changes happened to the guns except that you know a few months later they started you know popping up with K's stamped on the receivers instead of G's. Um, really, it's one of those things that, uh, in my opinion, I think it was just like a semi-propaganda move. Um, carabiner was kind of the new thing. There were machine carabiners like the, you know, the MKB-42. Um, you know, all the new guns were kind of carabiners and all the old guns were Gewehrs. So I think that was some of the, just the mindset behind it, just to make the gun maybe sound a little bit newer and cooler. Um, but other than that, it's just a simple name change, but it, it's... One of those things that does kind of confuse people. I mean, just doing a Google search or like a gun broker search or something like that, you kind of have to be specific or like add both in order to, you know, pull up different listings. So, but pretty much all the early 1944 to mid-1944 guns are still all going to be G43. And it was kind of late 44, uh, whenever the name change, you start seeing actual like K43s popping up. Um, but in their own notes and everything, the name change was pretty much immediate. People start referred, referring to them as K43s internally. So just because of the delays and, you know, from going from manufacturing to distribution and issuance and then moving to the front lines, um, by mid-1944, there was actually more G41s on uh, seeing frontline combat use uh, than G43s, um, which is pretty interesting. Like, you wouldn't really think that, but, you know, by the D-Day landings, um, you know, more troops, more German troops are using G41s. Um, about 120,000, I think it's a little less than 120,000 G41s uh, were made and issued. They went to all fronts. Um, you see a lot of pictures of 41s being issued, um, you know, in France, um, you know, around D-Day, um, which is cool for us because that's probably how guns like this you know, got here. In August of 1944, uh, the Gusoff Work Factory was actually destroyed 
in an error raid. So you see a hard cutoff of you know BCD marked uh, Gustav work G43s or K43s in August of 1944. Um, so they're they're a little bit uncommon. They weren't making that much before that point, um, but their manufacturing ended then. So um, so keep an eye out for G43s if you see them and look for that BCD. Um, those are a little bit more sought after. And by the end of the war, a little more than 400,000 uh, G43s or K43s were made. Um, that number's not 100%. Uh, Darren Weaver, he thinks the number's close to like maybe like 414,000 uh, G slash K43s rifles were made. So um, that's about it. That's not a whole lot. Now, you know, as far as, you know, an army that's, you know, has millions of troops, that's nowhere near enough. That's pretty much a drop in the bucket. But of course, you have other arms sort of supplementing that. You know, you have machine pistols and uh, Sturmgewehr stuff like that also being issued. Um, so by the end of the war, you kind of see a, this, you know, hodgepodge of different guns in a, in a unit. And that was sort of the, the Wehrmacht's policy. They knew they couldn't increase their troop strength any. You know, they just have a, a dwindling supply of troops and men at this point. So their, their sort of way to combat that was just to up the individual firepower, you know, in the German infantry infantry squad. So um, that's just kind of one part of what the G43 was meant to do, is just to supplement that and just increase the, the Wehrmacht's overall fighting capability. Now let's get in and do some close-ups of the rifles. I'm going to show you some of the late versus early war features of G43s and K43s, and also show you some close-ups of uh, G43 magazines and kind of the differences between them. So first off, uh, the stock on this K43, it is a reproduction stock, but this is one of the um, um, Fox Militaria's, you know, laminate stock. So this is, you know, pretty much how an original stock would be. Um, but this, this gun is a sport of rescue. Um, so the two guns here, uh, this one is a K43 made by Walther. It's a super, super late uh, 1945 gun. It's probably within the last like thousand or so made at, at the Walther plant. Um, here on the bottom, this is a G43 uh, made by uh, BLM, the Berlin Lubecker, in 1944. Um, this is a very early one. It's an A prefix. So um, this one has all of the early features that we'll get into and show off a little bit. Now here's the marking on the, uh, the BLM, the Berlin Lubecker gun. Their, uh, their code was DUV. Um, 44 is the date. And of course, this is a, a G gun because it's really early. Um, there's an A prefix on the serial number, so this is a, a, a very early um, G43 made. Um, and this one retains a lot of the early features that was omitted on the later guns. Um, so this is a pretty neat example to compare. Now this is the very late uh, K43 dated gun. Um, you can just barely maybe make out the AC. Um, Walther switched to putting the date code underneath the AC, so it's AC and then 45, a lot of the stamping here is below the wood line. I mean, obviously at this point of the war, they didn't care if you could see the markings anymore. Um, this is a G dated gun, so it's, it's within the last, you know, thousand or so made. Um, so you will kind of see on these later Walther guns, the markings kind of below the wood line. Um, that's just kind of a thing that Walther did. Now, starting with the muzzle here, um, we're gonna see quite a few differences between this uh, early, G43 uh, and this late one here. Um, first off, uh, there's a, an extra step that was machined into the barrel here at the very end. Of course, that step was omitted on later guns. Um, really, the biggest difference is this threaded muzzle. Um, there is sort of a, a little detent catch, spring-loaded detent catch there um, that was machined into this um, front sight base. Um, this is the actual uh, factory muzzle thread cover. Um, for the gun, you know, very little accessories were ever made or issued with these guns. Um, so early on, it was, I think, January 1944, uh, the order went out to stop threading muzzles on these guns. Um, so you won't really find G43s very often with threaded muzzles, um, which is nice from like a modern shooter's perspective or like a reenactor. Um, you can put a blank firing adapter much more easily. Um, on a G43 with a threaded muzzle. The front sight hood on uh, K43, G43s, um, these are different than K90 AK hoods. They, they look exactly alike, um, but these are different. They're actually taller uh, because the front sight blade is taller, so you need the extra height. If you try to put a K90 AK front sight um, hood on a, on a G43, it's just not gonna be tall enough. 
So you just kind of have to make sure that it's an actual G43 hood. Another change from uh, early to late is these uh, serrations that was machined on um, the front here, this front section of the front sight. Um, this was, you know, to uh, mitigate glare coming off of this large area right by your front sight. Um, but, you know, just one of those little things that you can eliminate and you can save, you know, quite a bit of machining work. Um, so they stopped adding the serrations and you'll just see this, you know, plain smooth front sights on later guns. Sometimes you'll run across um, this sort of plastic looking handguard. It actually looks um, a lot like wood. You might not have noticed it. Um, but this is kind of a type of compressed wood laminate plastic doohickey stuff called uh, Durafol. Uh, I'm not an expert on plastics or Durafol, um, but obviously this is not plain wood. Um, this is just kind of something you'll find on some manufacturers at some times. Um, most of the time you'll just run across, you know, plain wood um, top handguards. Um, but just something to know, this is kind of carried over by BLM. They did it on their 41s. And then they kind of added this Durafol uh, to the G43s as well. So um, just something to look out for. Kind of the only change with the rear sight from early to late is the, um, the omitting of these uh, knurled surfaces on the side of the rear sight adjuster here. So this is you know, nice and knurled on the early 43, just like it is on the G41. Um, they omitted that you know, later on. This is just a, a smooth button. I mean, it works identical. The knurling does add a little bit of purchase, but really this is pretty simple thing to just, you know, omit going forward. So both on the early and the late here, these are both, you know, stamped sheet metal action covers. Um, this is, you know, pretty standard that you'll find on, uh, on G43s and K43s. I mean, very, very early in the beginning, they used milled action covers on 43s, but for the most part, um, these are stamped. So these are the, these are the same. So now early G43s, they had a, an automatic dust cover. Um, this dust cover on top here, the later one, is probably something that you're a little bit more familiar with seeing. It's a little bit longer. It has this little folded up tab thing on the back. Um, this is because as the action is cycled, the dust cover gets pushed back. Um, it would remain back. And then, you know, when you're done shooting or whatever, you would just you know, manually push that forward. So this is the manual dust cover. Now, early on, these had an automatic dust cover. So this cover, uh, it does get pushed back uh, just like the later one. Uh, however, um, as you are done, you know, as the bolt cycles forward, um, the, there's a little tab inside of the dust cover that hooks up inside of the bolt carrier. And the bolt carrier actually pulls the dust cover closed automatically. So you don't have to worry about, you know, remembering to, uh, to push that forward. It means that this early action is pretty much always sealed up. Now, the problem with that, other than just the added complexity, which isn't really that much, um, it's that this part being, you know, automatically moved back and forth constantly. This is a really cheap uh, piece of steel. This is a very, you know, economic piece of steel that was being used here. Um, and these had the tendency to break just from being moved back and forth. These will wear out and break off. Um, so there was actually an order issued pretty later on to switch all the automatic dust covers to this manual type. So you don't see the automatics too often, only on the really early guns. Um, really most of the ones you'll see are this manual type or like a transition between the two. So now some of the differences between uh, an early and a late uh, bolt carrier group is you might have noticed the first thing. Um, it's the omission. Uh, this is kind of a Walther thing. Walther, late Walthers like this guy omitted this uh, bolt catch or the, the takedown bolt catch. Um, so when you pull this back, you'd press that button, it locks the bolt back all the way. Um, Walther redesigned the takedown of the G43 or the K43 to be able to omit that. And really the takedown method of this new, you know, late war Walther um, design, I, I think it's better than the early kind of compressing the system when you remove it with the, with the catch. Um, so to me, I really like the late war method. This is a definite improvement over the earlier war method. Um, also, you might have noticed this little ridge here. This is a little reinforcement ridge. Um, it, it's kind of odd because early bolts or early bolt carriers didn't have a ridge. And then it was added later on um, like this. So th as far as the ridge goes on the early and late guns, this should be switched. Um, it's just kind of neat. Um, I think they were maybe just using, you know, leftover parts um, on the K43 this late in the war. So um, just to kind of show you, you know, ridge and without ridge.
I'm going to go ahead and show you the different takedowns of the gun. So I'll start with the earlier gun. Um, this is how most people know the G43 needs to be taken apart. So you're going to start out by pulling the, uh, the bolt back and you want to press this button. Um, this you know, locks the bolt back separately from the, uh, the magazine hold open. Um, once this is back and the safety is on, you can just press this um, in and the whole system comes out and it's all fully compressed like this. Uh, now this is kind of the tricky part. Um, you want to, this is kind of the tricky part. You want to go ahead and hold this because if you press this button without holding this, this will just go flying. This parts will go everywhere. Um, so you want to hold this down and uh, press this button and then you can slowly release this. Um, and this is just kind of part of the design. This all sort of falls apart. Um, but this will allow you to see um, this automatic dust cover and this little nub. Um, that little nub sticking out um, goes into this recess um, in the top of the bolt carrier. And that's what locks and pulls the dust cover um, back forward on the gun. Now on these late Walthers, um, it's, it's so much easier. You don't have to worry about, you know, compressing everything. Um, you just keep the safety on. Um, you press the button and the action cover just lifts out. Here you can see the dust cover, you know, the absence of the little nub on it. Uh, and then just to get the, uh, the bolt carrier out, you just pull back on this and this just all comes out. Now here's that late and early uh, bolt carrier. I mean, externally, they're both pretty rough. Uh, you don't see that many differences there. Uh, and even surprisingly, internally, you know, on this super late gun, I mean, it's got about the same level of machining and, and finish to it. Um, but the, the main difference is, again, uh, the early one is here on the left. That's the recess for the automatic uh, dust cover. And that is, of course, omitted on the other one. Uh, and really, that's just the, the biggest difference here is this, you know, tick down latch um, and the automatic dust cover detent. Now, an interesting thing is, you know, we, we kind of repeatedly talk about how the Germans were just trying to simplify this and speed up production. And I think that part just sort of takes precedent in everyone's minds when it comes to, you know, G43 production is just, just make it as cheap and fast as possible. Just cheap, cheap, cheap. Um, however, Walther did incorporate some, and some improvements, which, you know, really did add um, steps to the overall um, gun design. It did add parts and added complexity and steps. Um, not just machining these out, but also um, this little hole. Uh, this is for the sort of bolt retaining uh, detent to fit into. Um, so on this earlier bolt, um, we'll, we'll give this a look over just so you can see uh, BLM, they tended to um, electro pencil their uh, extractor and the little uh, bolt lugs here. Um, so on this earlier design, um, pretty much just, you know, imagine you're late at night or just it's whatever reason. You pull this out of your gun, you're just a soldier in the trench, and all you do is tip it backwards and voila, you have all your parts just fell out of the gun and they're now in the dirt or the mud or it's dark and you just lost them. Uh, and that really sucks. So um, Walther improved that greatly um, with this system here. So uh, inside on the... Um, Inside here, you can see they added a spring. It's kind of hard to point out the, a spring and a detent on this uh, firing pin extension. Um, so that way, when this gets tipped um, backwards, that detent hits uh, that little area and catches and stops. Um, this will, if you do it enough, it will kind of fall out on its own. But most of the time, this does catch it and prevent uh, the, the parts from falling out. Um, so this is definite improvement. You know, it's, it's kind of the best you can do for a design like this. Um, I think it's a definite, you know, plus over the earlier system. Um, but just to show you that, you know, they weren't just trying to simplify. Walther really was trying to improve the system. Now let's talk some about G43 or K43 magazines. Uh, now there are six different uh, makers of these magazines. About two or three of them are like the most common and the other three are, are pretty uncommon. Um, AYE, it seems, or, uh, or GCB are some of the more common makers. Um, I have three um, AYEs and one uh, BCG here. Um, 
Now, you'll probably notice also the, the varying degrees of finish that are on these mags. Now, very early on, they just straight blued uh, these magazines. So they would just be, you know, regular blued, but that was only a, a very small number. Most of them are made and, and look pretty similar to this guy here. Uh, they gave it a light phosphate coated and then they uh, black, like painted it a black enamel paint. It's actually a lead based paint. Um, so most of them will look like this. Being a paint, these scratch up. These, these scratch up really easy. This is just how they look. Um, don't be too alarmed if you see them like this. This guy here, the great majority of paint is off of it. Um, it's mostly just that undercoat of phosphate that's showing through. Um, so you see them kind of all running the gamut. This one looks like it was tried to be rubbed or polished or something like that, or I don't know if this is natural use. Most likely um, somebody was trying to clean up the paint. They didn't like the look of that and they tried to clean it up. Um, but sometimes you'll find them like this. Uh, most rare of all the finishes, I think other than the blued, is a really late war, just plain heavy phosphate coat on the mag. Um, I don't know if that's what this is. This, this looks like it's a phosphate and then painted magazine. I think there's little remnants of paint on this guy, but um, the, the phosphate and the blue are the most common. Most of them are phosphated and, and painted like these. Now here's a close up of some of the markings that you'll find on the magazines. Um, only in the very beginning, really, and there's only two makers that stamp G43. Um, most of these mags you see will be stamped K43, but keep an eye out for G43 uh, stamped mags. Um, these are the, uh, the most um, least common of K43 or G43. Um, AYE, that's the main manufacturer of it. That's in Erfurt, Germany, the, the main manufacturer of these mags, the most common. And then, of course, you have the little uh, uh, Waffenamp there. The K stamp is a subcontractor. A lot of these parts were subcontracted out, so this is a different maker that made the floor plate on this guy that actually made the body of the magazine. Here's an AYE mag that is stamped uh, K43. You have the same, you know, Waffenamp on it. Um, on the bottom, there's no subcontractor marking for the floor plate, uh, but that's a, a K43 marked mag. Here's one more uh, K43 AYE magazine with the Waffenamp. Now, this magazine, I'm trying to get the camera right, you can see it. Uh, this magazine has what's it's kind of an uncommon uh, feature on these. It's got a little plus sign next to the Waffen Op. Now, there's, there's, they're not for sure what the plus sign means, but the best guess is that this is a spare magazine because they did that with Luger magazines. They put a little plus on it if it was a spare. Um, so the best guess right now is that uh, the plus means that this was a spare magazine, meaning that if, a, if somebody was issued a rifle, uh, you know, they'd have a magazine in the rifle already, but this would be one of the spare magazines that would be given um, to the person. And here is the uh, GCB magazine. Uh, you can tell this is, uh, this is magazine's in pretty rough shape. It's got a Waffenamp on it and a K43, like, you know, most of them will. Um, so these, you know, you, these do really run the gambit, and there's a lots of little complexities and nuances um, with these magazines that, uh, that you want to look out for. Uh, now I'll go ahead and I'll show you a, this is a reproduction magazine, and this is uh, a magazine that will, uh, this, this will really confuse people. Um, so here's the reproduction mag. First off, it's blued. You know, like I said, blued mags are very rare. They're probably not going to be in this good of condition. Um, also, this has, you know, fake Waffenamps put on them. Uh, the, the crazy thing is, this is the correct Waffenamp number, 892. Uh, Waffenamp 892 for, for GCB. Um, K43 mark. Now, the biggest giveaway of the reproduction magazine is this G43 slash K43. Uh, if you see a magazine, even if it has Waffenamps, if it has a slash in it, um, <laughs> it's this good a shape. This, this is a reproduction magazine. So, so they don't fall for it. Um, don't pay, you know, crazy money for a reproduction mag. Um, this magazine, the, the main reason why I bought it, I actually just bought the magazine body because on the, uh, the Sporter Restore gun that I had, this was the magazine that came with it. And this isn't super uncommon for G43 magazines to find them like this. This gun was, this magazine was cut and these bottom lips were shortened. And this was to reduce the capacity to like four or five rounds for hunting. Um, so you will run across magazines like this. Now what I did was I took the, uh, the floor plate or the, the follower, the floor plate and the spring 
out of this mag and I just put it into the body of a reproduction mag. So this is an original floor plate and follower on it. Um, so just so you know, don't fall for these. Don't pay too much for these, you know, reproduction mags. You know, look for something that's old and beat up. That's really the best bet. So here's three of the most common variations of G43 magazines to run into. There's some other really uncommon ones. Um, these, these I think are called like full stamped because this like little reinforced piece that's on the front here, it's a full long piece. Sometimes you'll run across them that are short, um, but this is the three most common ones. Um, now this first one here, it does not have the little rib, the little reinforcing rib. Um, this is kind of an early mag and yeah, this is the, the G43 one. So this is, this is an early mag without the rib. And then later on, they added the rib to the magazine here. Uh, and then lastly, they added this little hole. This is a moisture drainage hole, um, which, I mean, I guess it was needed if it's done, uh, maybe water pouring down through the top here could just come straight out of there, but there's already drainage hole in the bottom if it pulls up in the bottom, but um, that was just something they did. So uh, just here's your, your three main variations. So here's an example of a G43 pouch. This one's a reproduction and it's just like the, the full leather type. Um, originals were usually, you know, different colored leather and cloth. Um, canvas, you, you, you find all sorts of different colors and, and types of these. Some that don't have the buttons on the front, some have the little, you know, catching buttons on the bottom here. Um, but this is just an example. This holds just, you know, two magazines. This would be kept on the soldier's left side to help facilitate reloading because they would, you know, pull this, the magazine out with their left hand to reload to just help, you know, facilitate a faster reload. So they were only issued, you know, three rifles with the gun. Obviously, you just have one, you know, magazine in the gun and then you just, you know, have your, your two extra mags. So really that's only 30 rounds at your disposal for reloading. 30 rounds is not a whole lot for in combat. So as well as being issued this, they had a, just a standard K98K ammo pouch that just held an extra uh, uh, 30 rounds on stripper clips. Um, so after reloading these magazines, they would then switch to just reloading the, the G43 or K43 with stripper clips. Um, now I, I kind of showed this in a previous video, but the thing is when you reload with a magazine, it seems like it'd be a lot faster, but these magazines had to be retained. You know, these are valuable and important. So in the time that it took to remove the magazine from the gun, you know, open this up, extract an, you know, a fresh magazine and then put this magazine in it and then put that magazine in the gun. You really are wasting a lot of time. Um, it, it does, it, it takes a lot longer than you would think. It's, it's, so it's actually not that much faster reloading with the magazine from a pouch, retaining the mag, than it is just reloading with a stripper clip. Um, it's just a neat fact. A lot of people just, you know, think that this greatly improved the, you know, the speed of the reload, but not so much with retention and putting it back into one of these. The Volksgewehr program that the Germans implemented late in the war with a lot of these, you know, last ditch guns, a lot of these last ditch guns took G43 magazines. So when that program started up, it diverted the supply of, you know, thousands of these magazines from troops with G43s to these other guns. So later in the war, a soldier would really only just be issued, you know, the one mag with his gun and he'd just have to reload with stripper clips the whole time. So that especially defeats the purpose of having a reloadable magazine if soldiers aren't issued, you know, multiple. But um, again, that's just, you know, where the, the idea, you know, meets the, meets the actual, you know, facts of the battlefield. These mags are pretty expensive today. You know, they, they go, you know, maybe upwards of $300 or more depending on the variant. Um, but a million of these were made. They, I mean, a lot of magazines were made. Um, but if you do the math of, you know, 400,000 guns and, you know, 1 million magazines, you know, obviously that's nowhere near enough magazines. So that's, again, this is just one of those things they could not keep up production. I have to ask if you would please just click subscribe and like and comment and share and all that crap. Um, I appreciate it because it's just something I have to ask for because the YouTube algorithm is pushing back against, you know, this, you know, controversial topics like firearms videos like this, even though it's just, you know, historical firearms. Um, but thanks for doing that. It really helps, you know, spread the word. Um, so thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you guys watching and commenting and everything that you guys do. Um, thanks so much, and uh, I'll see you next time.